Welcome all to our symposium of this beautiful late April day, comparing and bridging across genocides, scholarly, cultural and political promises, challenges and taboos. This event was organized by the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies and the Ornesian Chair at the University of Minnesota and funded by the Wexler Fund for Genocide Education. We deal with comparative method today. And comparative method is something understood in sociology. At the macro level, scholars as diverse as Melvin Cohn, Charles Tilley, Theda Scotchball, neo weberians such as Steve Kohlberg, Phil Gorski, and today's presenters are among the renowned examples. Comparison is also common in practical life, in life of the streets and the politics. For example, the president of Armenia visiting in 2010, Syria, in the Church of Holy Martyrs at Deir Ezzor, said quite often historians and journalists soundly compare Deir Ezzor with Auschwitz, saying that Deir Ezzor, where hundreds of thousands of Armenians perished during the Armenian genocide, is the Auschwitz of the Armenians. I think that the chronology forces us to formulate the facts in a reverse way. Auschwitz is the day as so of the Jews. Only a generation later, the humanity witnessed the day as so of the Jews. At the same time, in everyday and political life, there are great sensitivities associated with comparison. So the previous book I took from my or quote I took from my book uh, Knowing About Genocide. In my previous book, I have a quotation and I'll read this sentence too. The director of one of the major Holocaust memorial sites in Berlin, that is, a rabbi and son of an Auschwitz survivor, when asked why German memorial sites do not add an alert mission to their commemorative function, as the US Holocaust Memorial Museum does, answered, and I paraphrase, the Armenians can, uh, sorry, the Americans can do that. If we did this as Germans, we would be accused of relativizing the Holocaust. These sensitivities that we encounter in everyday and political speech often enough spill over into academic discourse. And that is part of our agenda today. My name is Joachim Safelsberg. I'm a professor of sociology and by courtesy law and the Arsham in Charlotte Ornessian Chair at the University of Minnesota. I will now very briefly introduce our panelists for today, all of whom are among the most renowned scholars in the area we are covering. First, we will hear from Fatma Müge Göcek, who is a professor of sociology and women's studies at the University of Michigan. And she will collaborate in her presentation with Jacob Caponi, who is a PhD student in sociology at Michigan. And many of you know Fatma Müge's work from this opus magnum entitled Denial of Violence, Ottoman Past, Turkish present and collective violence against the Armenians 1789 to 2009. Afterwards, we will hear from Nathan Snyder, who is a professor in the School of Government and Society of the Academic College of Tel Aviv, Yafo. And Nathan, together with the third present, whom I'll announce in a moment, is the co-author of this recent book, Memory and Forgetting, in the post-Holocaust era, the ethics of never again, closely related indeed to today's theme. 
Finally, the co-author of Nathan Snyder of this book is Alejandro Baer, whom many of you know even locally. Alejandro Baer is professor of sociology, the Feinstein chair, and the director of the Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at the University of Minnesota. Last but not least, we have a discussant. The discussant is Professor Claire Mouradillon, who is Professor Emerita of History at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique, so the National Center of Scientific Research in Paris, and also a teacher at the École des Autitudes en Sciences Sociales. And Claire Mouradillon will give some discussant comments at the end of the presentations. She has a wealth of publications like all other presenters. I know her particularly also as a public intellectual. For example, she was a co-curator of the centennial exhibit on the Armenian genocide in the Shoah Memorial of Paris. So we have an element of bridging here between the Shoah and the Armenian uh, genocide as reflected in the location of that exhibit. We will keep the presentation short. Each presenter will speak no more than 12 minutes and Claire Mouradion will just raise maybe a question for each presenter. So we shouldn't use more than 45 minutes and then we'll have a half an hour for questions and answers with the audience. And uh, we'll talk about the technology of handling that after the presentations will have been delivered. So let us proceed in the order I suggested a moment ago. And let us begin with the presentation by Fatma Müge Göcek and Jacob Caponi from the University of Michigan. Uh, Fatma uh, Müge and Jacob, please, um, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, to the University of Minnesota for organizing this wonderful uh, occasion. Um, and uh, I, I say it's wonderful and very timely, not because, of course, it is the, the commemoration of the Armenian genocide. But in addition, I think the U.S. acknowledgement of the Armenian genocide is a very important turning point. Uh, and that has to be... Uh, uh, acknowledged, and I said uh, in in in, uh, in in context of that that uh, where can we go from here? I said, well, in the context of the United States, talking about bridging, it will be great uh, to use this as a first step, this acknowledgement as a first step to then look at uh, the genocides uh, maybe into uh, Native Americans and uh, Blacks that have occurred in this. Uh, um, uh, society. So that is uh, one way of, of going. And I think it also demonstrates the significance of acknowledgement, uh, um, because uh, especially uh, in the sort of global uh, order, what's very important is that things uh, like uh, the Holocaust have been globally acknowledged. And because of that, I think it puts in a very hard, uh, big epistemological weight on all other uh, instances of collective violence, and that I'm sure will be uh, discussed in more detail. Uh, here, I want to talk to you about where I went uh, after uh, doing an in-depth uh, study of the Armenian genocide within the context of uh, Turkey. Um, I went in three directions, uh, uh, two of which I'll discuss, and the third one I um, uh, am uh, undertaking with uh, a graduate student of mine and in uh, the spirit of uh, introducing the new generation that will be uh, working on these issues. Um, I uh, have with me Jacob Capone who will be talking about his research uh, or our research together in the last uh, couple of uh, minutes. There uh, were three directions as I said I went in after writing uh, uh, denial of violence. Uh, one was uh, to go and look at uh, the violence against the Kurds because once the Armenians were eliminated literally uh, from uh, Turkey, the same violence turned against, uh, the same genocidal violence almost turns against uh, the Kurds in a way that's continuing to this day. So I'll be, I have interviewed uh, 
courage to see what their experience of collective violence was in relation to the body, mind and spirit. That's sort of how I do it. Um, the other uh, part uh, was that I looked at how minorities, uh, especially in this case Armenians, uh, had suffered uh, through this. And I wondered if I could come up with a sociological theory that would focus on the uh, agency of minorities with respect to what happens to them. Can I tell the story and construct the theory from the vantage point of uh, uh, the minorities themselves? That's what I'm working on uh, at the moment uh, on a theory book. And the third one is about comparing uh, genocides. And in that spirit, uh, uh, my uh, student who works on uh, collective violence in Africa and I are doing a comparative study where I will, I'm putting the Armenian genocide in conversation with what's going on in Africa. And Jacob will tell you what that's about. Yes, Jacob. thank you so much for everyone for organizing and for having me. Um, so like Muge said, what we're doing is comparing specifically the case of the Rwandan genocide or the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi. And we're looking at how that compares to the Armenian case. So in Armenia, the government refuses to acknowledge that it occurred. Whereas in the Rwandan case, it's a very top-down process of a kind of a narrative that must be acknowledged and accepted. So what we do in Rwanda is look at women specifically as the minority group and how their experiences may differ. So taking gender into account in genocide and kind of placing those at the margins into the center um, and redoing our analysis of genocide. So women may have kind of navigated between these different identities of survivor and perpetrator, which we often think of as binary, where one has to be one or the other. Whereas in this case, women are facing multiple decisions at this matrix of oppression. So they're facing colonialism, patriarchy, genocide, racism, ethnic violence, et cetera. And in these cases, they must make many decisions such as taking foods that themselves and their children can survive, finding shelter, and a multitude of other decisions that occur very quickly in the chaos of genocide. And when we think about the memory making process of these, these women are often excluded from the collective memory or the violences they face are often lumped into the violences that they committed instead of what they also face. So what we do is kind of complicate the binary of survivor and perpetrator and look at how people can kind of navigate through these and multiple decisions that they must make in times of chaos. And this is very tricky because we also have to navigate genocide denial and making sure that emotions are centered um, and making sure that we can measure emotions in an equitable way that are forefronting their survivors as well. So what we do is place individuals who are facing those various levels of oppression and violence in the collective memory process and making sure that their stories and narratives are also heard. So while the assumptions are sometimes true that people fit into either survivor or perpetrator, it's oftentimes that they overlap or they conflict. So in order to do that, and in order to maintain peace, however we want to define that process, we must account for trauma broadly so that retaliation does not occur. Because as we see, there's periods of violence um, and multiple cases of genocide so that we look at and compare, there's a, the repetitization of who is committing violence or who is being attacked in these violences. So in order to address that, we must also address trauma of everyone involved, which again is difficult. However, I don't think that difficult means impossible. And my hope is that we can continually work towards these in an equitable way. Thank you. Muga, do you have things you want to add? Sorry, um, no, that's that's all. All right. Okay, fantastic. Very, very good. The dimension I hope we of within the time limit. That's why I'm like containing myself here. <laughs> oh, oh, you are. Well, well, this is wonderful. You, you were way beyond the time, uh, beyond the uh, underneath, underneath the time limit, uh, which is wonderful because it will give us opportunity yes. afterwards for more conversation. That would be really great. Uh, the dimension of gender clearly is important across all genocides and the agency of victims is such a fascinating theme during the genocide and after the genocide when it comes to cultural survival and to telling the story of genocide. So thank you for 
for this input. I should have mentioned uh, that Fatma Mugge Göcek is kind of wed to this comparative perspective she, because she was chair of the historical comparative section of the American Sociological Association. So I assume you uh, you were that for a reason and that that experience also colors uh, what you have to say. Thank you so much, Müge. Thank you so much, Jacob. And let us move on to our next presenter with Nathan Snyder from uh, Tel Aviv. Nathan, please, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. Good evening from Tel Aviv, and thanks for uh, having me. Um, I'm also a sociologist, and as a sociologist, of course, we are very prone to comparing uh, social and cultural uh, political phenomena. But I'm also a sociologist of knowledge. And I would like to take a kind of sociology of knowledge approach uh, about trying to figure out why we do compare and what is it good for? And even ask the question if comparing is good for us. And even when I look at the title of this panel, um, comparing and bridging across uh, genocide, across genocides, I'm, I'm sort of like asking myself that it's almost being considered an automatism that when you compare, we do bridge. And I'm not sure that's true. Uh, sometimes uh, comparing has very negative political implications and it takes down bridges. But very often it is assumed that when we compare, we do bridge and that comparing is good for us. I think I can put up a, a very careful thesis uh, by claiming that comparing could be bad for us as scholars, let's say of the Holocaust or scholars of genocide, even though we are obliged by our professional ethos to compare uh, sometimes we lose sight of what this comparison is really um, all about. Um, I give you an example. Um, I'm, I'm observing uh, right now uh, fierce debates in Germany about the comparison between the Holocaust and German colonial violence. It was triggered a while ago, and I think it has to do with uh, Germany becoming a global player, and German intellectuals also want to be global players, and as global players, they don't want to be caught up in the uniqueness of the Holocaust uh, theory, also because many of them have sort of like, um, I would say, um, leftist uh, political views that they, they lean to the left and the uniqueness of the Holocaust has now been considered something that is being pushed forward by the Israeli government. So you as a leftist intellectual, of course, are against it. So you, you do the comparison and you go then on into comparing it to what? You can compare to other genocides, of course, and you know most institutions like uh, uh, the, in, the institutions in Minnesota itself is called the Holocaust and Genocide Centers. So that means that there is an end between Holocaust and genocide, which means that you have to compare, but you also have to separate them. Otherwise you would call it like a genocide uh, study center where you also study the Holocaust. So the same with Holocaust and Genocide Studies as uh, as as a journal and the other journals like the Journal of Genocide Studies, which usually does uh, for political reasons also uh, reject the uniqueness of the Holocaust thesis. And I'm not saying here, I'm not, this is not, the argument is not to prove that the Holocaust was unique or it cannot be, uh, that it cannot be compared and it can be compared. I'm just saying that these are speech acts that these are political speech acts. When you say the Holocaust is unique, you wanna say something politically, you don't wanna say something scientifically, and then you say it can be compared, you do the same usually on the other side. 
a while ago, almost a year ago now, um, a very famous African scholar, uh, Achim Membe, was supposed to receive a prize in Germany and a big scandal broke out because people were sort of like digging in into um, uh, into Mbembe's writings, uh, you, you may know them, the critique uh, of black reason, la, la critique de la, de la raison negre, necropolitics, and, 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 other <coughs> and other books. And he is considered to be a very important player in the field of uh, post-colonialism. And uh, his argument is that racism is a very, is inherent in European history and develops it historically. I'm not saying it's, 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 it's not a good book. I'm not saying it's a good book. I'm saying that he sort of like develops certain arguments and part of the argument is also uh, to claim that the Israeli politics in, in, the, um, in the occupied territories is part of a huge system of exclusion that can be compared again the, the aspect of comparison can be compared to south africa can be compared uh, to other things there's there's a certain generalization of the politics of ex exclusion he was also uh, has been uh, identified at a certain time with the boycott movement against israel and a big scandal broke out if somebody like this can receive a prize which is funded by uh, the German public uh, sphere, by the German government, and articles in favor, articles against. And underneath all these articles was uh, coming across a view that says, you see, uh, uh, you are uh, uh, German provincials, you think the Holocaust was uh, unique, but we are now globalizing our consciousness about victimhood and we also think about colonialism and we sort of like push forward a certain scholarship that Mbembe might may be part of it may not be part of it that says that the, the Holocaust that happened between in the 1940s uh, uh, in, in, in mostly in Eastern Europe has been a sort of like a continuation of German history, which has to do uh, uh, with Southwest uh, uh, Germany and, and, and the genocide that, German, that the German army conducted there with uh, with two um, with two African tribes, and you know we can we can we can show that there are certain uh, common patterns, and even Hannah Arendt wrote about this in in, in 1951. And, and if you show that you have a German that you have a German Jewish intellectual who also sort of like pushed that view forward, then you can you can actually uh, uh, you can actually sort of like build yourself a line of defense which which holds its ground and and the same happened also and and I, I'm sure you you're familiar with Michael Rothberg's book about multi-directional memory which was just translated into German also with a very interesting delay of uh, uh, of 12 years or so and these debates are arriving in Germany with a certain delay of a decade which has another which I think can be explained politically as well. And uh, uh, and Joachim has mentioned it uh, in his introductory talk. Then there's the, the claims of relativizing the Holocaust and versus uh, provincializing the Holocaust. And, and and all I'm trying to say, and with that I'm 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 I'm, I'm going to stop. That uh, that we have to be as, as scholars of this field, we have to be extremely extremely careful not to be dragged in into the politics of these debates. And what I'm seeing is that, uh, 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 yes, that's, that's right. Human Rights Watch has just published its major, uh, major study comparing Israel to, to South Africa and, and, and the concept of apartheid. Yes, the, the, the person who wrote that in, in, in the chat is, is, is correct about that. And I think we, we as scholars of this field we need to sort of like build a line of defense around our scholarly work and have to be careful to not have, not to let it uh, uh, totally be politicized. As I'm also a big fan of, of sort of like leaving politics out of the classroom 
and explaining politics and not being part of politics. So I'm, I'm making here a, a clear cut division between scholarship and social activism. And I think that this division has been completely blurred in the last years, not only in America, but in other countries as well. And with that, I'm going uh, to stop. Thank you very much, uh, Nathan Snyder. Um, these were provocative points. You tell us at the same time that comparative work is part of our job and you tell us that comparison may be bad. So we are forced to do a bad job. Um, we will, of course, in our conversation, maybe get to the point where we distinguish between comparing and bridging and certainly between comparing and equalizing. Those concepts are often uh, mixed up, which is uh, very problematic. It seems quite clear that in order to identify the uniqueness of a historic event, and all historical events are unique, we have to engage in comparison. Otherwise, we couldn't state that something differs from others. Now let us travel, uh, continue our journey that led us from Ann Arbor, Michigan to Tel Aviv, Israel, and move on to uh, the Twin Cities of Minnesota, where Alejandro Baer is waiting in order to uh, give us his thoughts about this difficult subject. Uh, please, Alejandro, the floor is yours. Thank you, Joachim. And it's, it's great to be here in such great company. I also want to thank Joe Eggers for uh, helping to organize this panel and taking care of all the technical aspects. And uh, well, Nata mentioned the, the name of the center, right? The Center for Holocaust and, and Genocide Studies. And so it's really not only Holocaust scholarship, but also centers, memorials, museums, and even the commemorative ceremonies that are somehow uh, torn by two contending approaches. On the one hand, the Holocaust was a crime unique to Nazi Germany that was made possible by, by a very specific historical context and was exclusively targeted at the Jewish people. And on the other, uh, the Holocaust was part of the universal phenomenon of genocide, which has occurred with other people's targets and may occur again elsewhere. Those in the first um, camp or aligning with the first approach are concerned that the Holocaust will be open through comparisons to other events, to all sorts of distortions, abuses, and that this will ultimately lead to the delusion and even the denial of the Holocaust. Those on the other side are concerned, and uh, maybe I referred to it at the beginning, uh, that an overemphasis on the Holocaust, uh, on the Shoah and on its uniqueness, is depriving other histories of uh, collective violence of visibility. So now from the angle and of so the sociology of collective memory, uh, the latter claim does not really hold water at least not uh, in, in just as, as that, right? Uh, it's not an either or, it's not a zero sum game as, as, as Rosberg claims. If we think of Alexander's cultural trauma theory, the Holocaust is unique and not unique at the same time. Uh, it was the very status of the Holocaust as a unique event, as a symbol of ultimate evil that eventually compelled it to become generalized and be particularized, right? And also the work of of, of Nathan and, and Daniel Levy on cosmopolitan memory uh, argues that uh, the Holocaust has been influential in raising the level of attention to past violence and even the responsiveness to present forms of human rights relations. In, 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 in the book uh, you, you mentioned, Joachim, at the beginning, we somehow uh, do um, qualify uh, a little bit the thesis of cosmopolitan memory and I would like to um, um, bring in a few uh, thoughts and also from my, my, my most recent research um, qualifying diseases of cosmopolitanization because we are somehow at the point where the Holocaust has become a screen onto which different political actors in, in local context project their ideological positions. And um, the findings I, I would like to share with you are from Holocaust commemorative ceremonies and I would like to to show that, to highlight that not only the comparison to the Holocaust, analogy, so equations have become a function of memory politics in local context, but also Holocaust uniqueness claims. 
Um, this is a research project I did um, a couple of years ago, we finished last year with Yamor Karakaya, uh, in which we analyze local Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremonies, that those that are promoted by the IHRA, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance um, in Spain and in Turkey. We look at these two cases. And Turkey is, is a really a fascinating case. Uh, uh, it is part as an observer country of the IHRA and it commemorates every January 27 since 2015 uh, the Holocaust through an official uh, ceremony. In these ceremonies, uh, not very surprisingly, the Turkish government highlights the Holocaust singularity. Tropes of Jewish innocence, unprecedentedness, stressing the systematic nature of extermination uh, are um, included in the statements, uh, mostly of government officials that participate in the ceremony. Obviously this strengthens you know, somehow this shield against an accusation of an Armenian genocide, because if the Holocaust, the systematic and, and industrial murder of European Jewry is taken as a yardstick, then uh, one can safely claim that not such a thing occurred in Ottoman times. And the title of our paper uh, is the following, such hatred has never flourished on our soil. This is a direct quote from um, a government official in the official Holocaust ceremony. So actually more is at stake here. And I think it's interesting to look at these new developments. What we see here is that the nation overrides uh, the universal openings that this transnational initiative could potentially provide. So we know that cosmopolitanization always takes place in a local context, but here we see that somehow the nation is in charge of these translations. Moreover, the nation state, in this case, a national denialist narrative, uh, I'm interested in, in, in learning what uh, Claire and uh, Miguel think about this. The nation has acquired a whole set of new, new tools, new cultural tools, through claiming an, an adherence to an absolute universal, remembering the Holocaust. So in Turkey, it seems very unlikely that these initiatives will uh, open up any discursive opportunities for seeking parallels and analogies through which to understand and commemorate, commemorate uh, its own violent past. So in Spain, it's, it's, it's somewhat different because we have two contested claims emerging in the Holocaust Remembrance Ceremony. In Spain, it's since 2005 that uh, the country is commemorating the Holocaust. Also important to mention that neither Spain uh, have a direct connection with the, the events that are being commemorated, only indirect, that indirectness, of course, uh, can be stressed or can be, um, or, or not, as, as we'll see in, in a second. Now, whether the Holocaust is presented as a unique event or as comparable to other atrocities, this has become an expression of where one is positioned in Spain in regards to this Spanish memory conflict. So what is at stake here is not really the Holocaust, but it's not the evaluation or the re-evaluation of the nation's recent past, which is the Franco regime and the now deeply contested transition to democracy, lack of acknowledgement, lack of reparation, lack of, uh, uh, of justice and even the legitimacy of the political actors who are tied to those processes, particularly to the transition. So initially this, this initiative to remember the Holocaust, which is a top-down initiative, right? It comes, uh, it's this uh, former IHRA, the, the International Task Force for Holocaust Education, which has, uh, the members are, are states. And this uh, initially was seen with reservation, with some suspicion by Spanish conservatives, because, because, because it did not, uh, it did cut against the grain of, of the mantra of the Spanish transition, looking forward, not looking past, let bygones be bygones, etc. And of course, it would unavoidably spill over right to the history of, of Francoism, uh, as Franco as one of Hitler's allies. Um, in order to bypass this problem, Span Spanish conservatives sought to highlight the uniqueness of the Holocaust. And in the last years, we see that the People's Party and even Vox, the new far-right party in the country, have embraced the tenets of Holocaust remembrance while uh, conveniently stressing the Shoah's singularity and incomparability. 
And here the uniqueness claim will not only emphasize that there is a qualitative difference between the Holocaust and all previous and subsequent genocides, also that there is a fundamental distinction uh, uh, between the Nazis' assault against the Jews and the persecution of other groups in Nazi Germany and during the, the Second World War. Right? From a scholarly perspective, uh, this, uh, I mean, you can make an accurate claim that there are, of course, those distinctions. But what matters here is how is this employed in uh, in the in the politics in Spain. So the, the uniqueness claim allows to draw a fundamental distinction between Nazism and Francoism to which the People's Party is, in, is uh, linked by Beres. It was founded by um, a minister of the, of the Franco regime. And Vox too is linked to that uh, uh, origin because it's a splinter uh, of, the, of, the, of the People's Party. So of course, it's important also to see the context in which these claims take place and also to see this as a dynamic and, and fluid process. And, uh, and this context is one in which the political adversary, the left from the socialists to the other um, uh, left-wing parties, from Podemos or, or others that have emerged recently, and Catalan separatist parties have emphasized Franco's role as a Nazi collaborator and fused the memory of Spanish victims of the dictatorship to that uh, of the Holocaust. Um, or under the broader term fascism. Uh, of course, these presentations can lead to very stark historical distortions. So also thinking back of the initial concern uh, about those who claim the singularity, even in scholarship. For example, um, uh, also in scholarship. For example, uh, on, in 2020, on Holocaust Remembrance Day ceremony, the second deputy prime minister of Spain at the time, Pablo Iglesias, who's also the Secretary General of the left wing Podemos party commemorated liberation of Auschwitz without mentioning Jewish victims. Uh, he tweeted the following tens of thousands of people were murdered there, in reference to, to Auschwitz, including hundreds of Spanish Republicans. Memory, so as not to repeat history, fascism never again. So the left opens the semantic scope, you know, the historical and conceptual frame of the event, Auschwitz is subsumed under the generic term fascism, uh, with the consequence in this example specifically, avoiding entirely the event of its specificity or, or, or even the, the, the location uh, of you know, the name Auschwitz, of its specificity and, and significance in the destruction of European Jewry. On the other side, conservatives present in these commemorations the Holocaust mainly as a crime against the Jews, as the Shoah. In this form, Holocaust memory acts as a convenient screen memory. So to conclude, we see particularly through these new developments of, um, of, of commemorating that takes place on, not only on January 27, there's also Yom HaShoah, there's multiple occasions of commemoration and it's very visible, very present. The Holocaust is remembered across borders, but the story and the messages it entails, they vary dramatically and above all, uh, not only, but it is also a national or a local story. And the shape that this story takes is contingent on uniqueness and comparison claims. I will leave it there and I, I look forward to, to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, uh, for these provocative comments. Uh, how you, I admire how you link uh, the uh, notion of cosmopolitanism with the notion of national particularity. Um, and this will be part of our conversation in a moment. No, having traveled from Michigan to Israel and from Israel to Minnesota, we'll travel back in an easterly direction and we'll arrive in Paris, France, where Claire Mouradion has prepared a couple of questions to one or the other presenter or to all of the presenters. Uh, Claire, please, the floor is yours. Hello, thank you for inviting me again. And thank you to all the my colleagues which presented very um, stimulating uh, 
presentation, although short, but uh, they they, each one of them uh, raised a lot of questions. So um, first I will start by saying that I'm, uh, I, it seems to me that I'm the only historian here and uh, I'm talking to sociologists, so maybe my point of view will differ a little bit uh, uh, on methodological uh, point of view or whatever, because, well, the main part about comparison, the, um, for historians, uh, we have also always to context, put in context, to contextualize. It's one of our uh, main uh, methodology. But nevertheless, we have also, and as a human being, generally speaking, and I was very interested in that what Nathan said about, uh, about the um, sociology of knowledge, uh, we have also to uh, um, understand the past through our present time uh, categories, theories, uh, uh, way of living, and we have to understand the events and so we are always compelled also to compare to uh, uh, to make also people understand the narrative we are uh, talking about so um, what I would say about uh, comparison and I, I think to me it's very important and maybe I won't do much more through uh, um, theories but uh, I'm a part, well I'm involved in long durée and the long durée story uh, made us understand uh, red threats uh, and to understand the similitude of mechanism and I will for instance for me when I'm working on the Armenian genocide or trying to compare also with all, all other uh, mass uh, violence. I'm trying to, or policy of uh, the empires that uh, were these events, uh, various mass uh, violence, uh, extreme violence uh, occurred. I'm trying always to uh, look at the mechanism, maybe more than the, uh, the precise uh, facts of uh, what, which the, <coughs> the elements which led all the time to genocide. <coughs> but the basic fact also that each empire or each country, each state, uh, look at the others. Uh, there is always a kind of mirror effect uh, uh, in, uh, their, uh, uh, in their action. I will have a few questions. I'll try to ask a few questions to each of uh, our panelists, or maybe only one, to um, uh, Fatma Muguet, to Muguet and uh, Jacob. Uh, it was uh, very interesting. I was very interested by uh, the, uh, the, your free direction. And also, also, of course, I know all your, the work you've done before. I have a question about the uh, theory of agency. Uh, the theory of agency is not there, is not in this theory a risk of uh, uh, saying that people, uh, in a way, since they were also, also actors of their destiny, of course they did a lot of things to save or what you, all you, you mentioned, but it's not a risk to say at the, at the end that after all they, they were also actors of their destiny, so they deserve it. But I was very interested in what, about what you said about also um, um, the, 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 the gender, well, considering uh, uh, at the same time the minority issue and the gender issue. And uh, for, for the gender issue, maybe we should add maybe another part. It's about the orphans also, because the orphans, which could be all boy or girls also, uh, could they enter the agency uh, theory or not, and in another way. And also at the minority, uh, minority issue, uh, I think it uh, make, uh, make, make us um, try to understand the nature of state uh, which excludes uh, their uh, minorities as did the Ottoman Empire or some other empires. And the fact that they exclude each minority one after the other kind of a tactic of salami. And uh, after the, Arme the Greeks, the Armenians, the Yazidi, the Kurds, the Alevi, uh, now they are also, also excluding in a way women and uh, intellectuals. So there is, a, in the, it makes us uh, try to think about the nature of uh, the state who allow uh, this kind of uh, uh, policy. And Nathan, I would ask also a question about uh, um, the colonization and the colonialism and and, uh, uh, and uh, not only Holocaust, but the, uh, uh, the issue of uh, uh, empires, imperial policy. Uh, and uh, because colonialism, 
uh, it's also an, uh, in a way it's also the effect of uh, uh, will of ex expansion and uh, with uh, various uh, uh, various aspects and here there is a taboo because uh, we consider usually that there is some classic uh, colonial empire France, Britain, uh, Spain, uh, Netherlands, but we never uh, apply these uh, categories uh, to a Russian Empire or to a Soviet Empire or to uh, Ottoman Empire. And uh, so it would be interesting also to, to have a comparison uh, in these uh, aspects. Maybe I'm not very clear about that, but I think that the uh, issue of colonialism should not be uh, excluded at once or uh, be considered only as a threat to uh, not understand the uniqueness of uh, the Holocaust. Each, each one of the, uh, of the, um, of the uh, uh, genocides and uh, are in a way unique and uh, occurred in a unique uh, context and at a unique time. But nevertheless, there are some, uh, again, some uh, uh, Compar well, not comparative, but similar threads when you study it from the point of view of policy, imperial policies. And some, and not to say that imperial policies always uh, go to uh, genocide or to Holocaust. So it would be interesting to understand why in some cases they do and why in other cases uh, uh, they don't. Uh, well, we just uh, evoked also, uh, you talked about uh, Rwanda, and Rwanda is also an issue of uh, colonial history, but we have some others, Cambodia, or post-colonial issues, uh, or at the, the end of uh, col in colonial empires. Uh, what about uh, uh, the Polish pop uh, peoples of the uh, Soviet Union, Holomodor, Rohingyas, Uyghur? So we, I think we should um, try to also think of them in a kind of more general uh, uh, vision and to uh, integrate uh, uh, this aspect. And with uh, to Alexandro, I think uh, you were very right, very right to um, to to do that. Each ceremonies, each commemorations, or uh, acknowledgement, recognition, or on the contrary, uh, denialism uh, happened in uh, occurred in a very special uh, uh, political uh, context. I would just uh, suggest uh, there was a very interest to to look at a very interesting report which was prepared by um, Europeans about uh, ten years ago. Uh, it was a comparison uh, within all the countries of uh, the U European Union about their policy um, uh, related to um, hate uh, speech and um, acknowledgement of not of this or that uh, uh, genocide uh, by laws uh, criminalizing uh, denialism or on the contrary refusing to that. And it was very interesting to see that, for instance, in some uh, Eastern uh, European countries, they would just, uh, of course, everybody acknowledge the Holocaust, but uh, for instance, about uh, Stalinism, some put uh, the crimes of communism Stalinism uh, in the um, in the laws, some didn't want to. So it was very interesting to compare the policies of all European countries. And I would suggest it would be very interesting to compare it at a more general level to see the uh, not only in terms of ceremonies, but to the um, the laws that are accompanying this. Sorry, I I, I was too, a little long and my. I think I, I hope my English was not too broken to make you understand the question I had in mind. <laughs> it was very difficult to have uh, to just <laughs> try to do that spontaneously and uh, trying to enter a very uh, uh, rich panel with uh, various uh, aspects uh, which were all uh, uh, which would have uh, deserved uh, each one uh, three or four hours of discussion. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you very much, Claire. I do appreciate it. And we do need the voice of a French. We need the voice of an Armenian. We need the voice of a historian amongst us. Absolutely. And I'm very grateful for the comments. I'm sure they will evoke some reaction on the part of the other panelists. What I suggest at this point is that all panelists, please turn your cameras on so you will all be visible to the audience as we begin to engage in a conversation. Um, I 
will suggest that we may begin by giving each panelist maybe two minutes to respond to what others have said, including, of course, especially what Cl Claire Mouradian has said. So, um, so why don't we proceed in the same order in which you gave your presentations? And after this round in which each of you take about two minutes, very concise again, we'll then open it up for questions from the audience. So let's begin with uh, Müger and Jacob, please. Any thoughts that the other presentations or Claire, Claire's comments evoked in you? Uh, thank you very much, and I'll be very brief. Claire, uh, you were fortunately or unfortunately very clear. I totally get what you're saying uh, about agency. I think what's very interesting about these presentations is that most of them are only looking at things top down uh, with respect to state policy, with respect to sort of the political discourse that emerges over time, either denial, acknowledgement, and engagement with the Holocaust when they're looking at other uh, genocides and such. Uh, what is, I think, also important is to look at the agency from the bottom up, from um, civil society. And in that context, I think, uh, that's why I turn and look at uh, the perpetrators and survivors in the context of uh, the Kurds and other groups. Uh, so that is a dif distinction I would like to, to mark uh, with me, our, our presentation, we sort of have moved beyond that uh, top uh, bottom divide to look at meaning construction and how that occurs, especially from the bottom up to capture the agency of the social actors. And then I'll turn it over to Jacob uh, to focus on, I guess, imperialism, colonialism, and things like that. Thank you. Yes, Jacob, please. Thank you. Yes, I'll just add I, the point about orphans is interesting. I think um, moving beyond that, even just children generally who participate in the violence. In the Rwanda case, there was the Inner Hamway, which was a youth militia killing group, and the youth militia is known in other contexts as well. And I think we have to look at like the situated agency, um, which is where the subnational comes in, which is combining what Muge was talking about about the top down and the bottom up and how these different levels of violence vary throughout the context. Um, in some contexts, women were more involved where they were orchestrating the violence, or in other parts of the country, that wasn't the case. Um, so looking at it also throughout the geographical, spatial, and you know temporal, and how the violence spreads um, is important to understand how it happens, as well as the memory-making process afterwards to make sure that one area doesn't dominate the conversation of what happened during the violence versus another. Thank you. What I, if I may, what I wanted to say is that I understand all the theory, and I know it's a very in fashion actually at present time. But one of the risks I wanted to say is that, uh, especially for the victims, is to uh, well to um, to, uh, to, uh, to be looked at, at at not so much victim as they should be. I don't know if I make me understand, uh, and to be a kind of. Uh, uh, in France, we would say actors of their, of their destiny, actors of a fate. So there is danger here to uh, exclude a little the role of a state, uh, the intention, the... Uh, uh, and I understand completely that we need, to, of course, we do all that, all, always that to go uh, uh, bottom up, but uh, we must... Well, there is a risk there to, uh, uh, to, to forget uh, nevertheless, the, the role of the state, the intention, the, uh, the, the power of the state. And to, 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 put, some to, to, to put symmetry among uh, asymmetrical uh, actors. Uh, I totally agree with you. I think that is why we need, as post-colonial approaches talk about, critical self-reflexivity, who we are, also emphasizes what we focus on. So as a scholar, you know, in this case, in the Armenian case, my being an ethnic Turk was very important. And, you know, for Jacob, you know, being an American coming uh, and looking at these things, he has to also come to terms with that. Um, I totally agree. And that is one thing uh, we do not agree at uh, in sociology. Do you bring in that critical self-reflexivity of 
who you are and why you study what you do, or do we not? Uh, and, and there is, of course, divide, as Joachim knows about that. Thank you. Thank you very much. This, of course, is another comparative question. Uh, it would be a fascinating project, despite all objections to comparative analysis in this area, to look at the at the agency that victim groups had in, across different genocides. And I, I'm, I'm sure we would find interesting um, interesting um, distinctions that are reflective of the historical context that Claire so rightfully uh, highlighted in her own comments. Um, uh, let's move on to Nathan, please. Nathan, do you want to respond to anything anyone else said or to Claire's comments specifically? Yeah, I, 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 first of all, I think I'm, I belong to the other camp and I'm, I'm against uh, too much reflexivity. And uh, um, I, don't, I, I wouldn't like to start any kind of intervention or article or book with me as blah, 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 will argue that this and this and that. So it's like I, I, I'm really trying to take the me and the reflexivity out of, uh, and I think, I mean, I would, I would even argue that this is what we're supposed to do. And I mean, I have quarrels with, with this kind of overemphasis of reflexivity by post-colonial scholars who think that they can sort of like superimpose the subjectivity on the subjects that they're, that they're concerned about. But, but I mean, that's, that's another, that's, a, that's another uh, debate. I mean, I'm, I'm concerned, and this is of course part of this, how to talk sociologically about uh, politics. I mean, this is, this is what I'm really, uh, this is really what, what, what I'm concerned about. And one of the examples was like uh, Alejandro's intervention before when he's tried to analyze the, 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 the debate about the uniqueness of the Holocaust in Spain. This was sort of like the kind of sociological analysis about the political agendas that, that, that I had in mind. Now to Claire's question about uh, uh, colonialism. Now, I, I, it was never my intention to exclude uh, 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 col colonialism from the debate about Holocaust, uh, but to ask myself, uh, again, the same question, uh, what is it good for? Um, if you take, for instance, um, this kind of multidirectional uh, uh, fashion that, that is going around now to, to connect uh, um, uh, anti-colonial thinkers and their take on the Holocaust and everybody is sort of like is quoting Aimé Césaire as, as this big example who wrote already in, in the beginning of the 1950s that everything that Hitler has done to the Jews has been done by Europeans to Africans before. Wonderful quotation. You will find it in every post-colonial discussion on the Holocaust. But what does it say? And what is that speech act actually supposed to tell us? Here you have, uh, uh, you have a, 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 a scholar who, who, who expresses his deep, deep frustration with French colonialism, with the breaking of the promise of the French of African independence after World War II. And he sort of like takes account with uh, the French and sees now the French and the Germans together as the evil Europeans. I'm not saying you cannot do this. I mean, you can make an argument that this is true as long as you know what the politics is behind it. Because the interesting thing is that post-colonials are always demanding self-reflexivity, but very often lack actually self-reflexivity when it comes to their own uh, uh, political agendas, which are basically very particular, but are being sold scientifically and are being sold as universal, even if they are not. And, and all I'm saying is that you can, of course, discuss colonialism and the Holocaust together if your political agenda is leading you to that point. But if it epistemologically makes any sense, that's a completely different question. 
That's exactly the point. I mean, I'm taking you on because I'm assuming uh, uh, because I'm assuming you took issue with what I said. Uh, uh, one thing you need to recognize is that uh, there is a fundamental assumption uh, in all postcolonial studies with respect to Western European modernity and what that meant. First of all, it's assumed that Western European modernity takes shape uh, with respect to what's happening in European society specifically and applies it to the rest of the world. And when it does that in the context of collective violence, it chooses from the repertoire that was established in uh, Europe to start with, and in the process excludes a lot of collective violence, includes other ones. And that is why it's important uh, to look at. With respect to myself, if I am uh, studying uh, the Armenian genocide and my identities are important, but the one that's pertinent in this particular context is my identity as an ethnic Turk, because I belong to the category of the perpetrators. I wonder if you could write a book about the Holocaust if you are German and not mention it. That's what I mean. I mean, what would you say to that? Thank you. Uh, so, so let let me let me tr try to keep some some order in the game, and uh, it's my my job as a German Muga, as a German, right? Uh, so, uh, I, I I want to give Nathan an, an opportunity to respond uh, briefly, uh, but Claire had a, had a point too. So oh, I, please make your point, and then Nathan no, will uh, no, to I, I completely, pass it on to Alejandro. Yeah, no, I completely agree with uh, what uh, Nathan said, but I said that at the same time, uh, you said uh, I we I put well, we are not uh, as scholars, we are not activists, but at the same time, as scholars, uh, we are also trying to, um, in a way, to uh, give uh, tools to the citizens to understand their, uh, well, the, the present through by the, what happened in the past. And uh, I think it's important to uh, analyze, uh, as I said, mechanism and things that led to this and that uh, situation at a, mo at a precise moment in a, spe a specific context, but with some similarities that you can see when you look at different uh, uh, different uh, empires at the same time at, or uh, countries or states. So that's what what I meant. That's what what I meant uh, to try to compare. Uh, and I think that I, I'm not in post-colonial study as you uh, studies in, as you uh, present them, but it's another point. It's another point of view. Uh, it's uh, uh, historians or sociologists or anthropologists are uh, uh, also, um, uh, how could I say, uh, well, not teach, teachers or professors, but trying to give uh, uh, those who don't study this or that more uh, thoroughly uh, keys to understand uh, the elements and maybe to prevent them. With, with those. Thank you. Thank you, Claire. Nathan, do you want to comment briefly back on what uh, Muga and Claire said? Yeah, but I don't think that we're going to get anywhere with that. I mean, I, I, I think that uh, identity is overrated and uh, that we should keep it in check as scholars and that we have that, I mean, I have an identity, if you want to call it, as a sociologist, and I have a political identity as a Jew, as an Israeli, as, 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 as a certain political agenda, and it is my job to keep them apart, I mean, and, and, and not have to superimpose my identity or identities. And it, it's sort of like, I mean, what these people, well, not these people, that's, that's not fun, it's not nice to say, but what I see is that, 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 a certain of like of essentializing identity that on the one hand you're against it because you're for hybridity and you're for you for that and you're for the other and then you're sort of like essentializing identity when you start writing your scholarship and, uh, and of course there are Germans who write about the Holocaust why shouldn't they write about the Holocaust and I and I suppose there are the people of ethnic Turkish background who write about uh, uh, what happened to the Armenians and I don't think we need like an introduction of 10 pages where we explain that. 
uh, to our audience uh, who we are when we write about uh, uh, certain subjects. It's nobody's business who we are when we think. I mean, this is this is this is my take, but I, I, I'm sure that 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 this is not not acceptable for for others. Oh, Nathan, I I appreciate that, and this is of course a debate that is at least a hundred years old, and what has lasted for a hundred years will not be resolved in seventy five minutes. So it's it's good to have these different positions stand here in the room. A really interesting analysis would be a, a comparative analysis of people of different national backgrounds writing about the same historic event, including the same genocide, how, is there a systematic difference in the analysis of the Holocaust between uh, Israelis and Germans, for example, between Jews and non-Jews? Is there a systematic difference in the presentation of the genocide against the Armenians when written by Armenians or when written by Turks or when written by people of other nationality? Uh, so in part, there is an empirical question if people confess or don't confess at the beginning of their books. It's an empirical question if indeed this kind of uh, standpoint uh, does color the quality and character of, of the analysis. Uh, maybe a project yet, yet to be done. Uh, but I want to pass the floor on to Alejandro, who has not had an opportunity to respond yet. Yes, well, I, I want to be brief because I'd like to hear maybe some comments or insight from also from, from the audience. Uh, I have a somewhat different view. I think, um, I mean, even if you look at history and historiography, if you look at the turn in historiography, I mean, we cannot, and that applies, of course, to our scholarship as well. I mean, the, just how we select and how we frame our objects of study always has something to do with us or where we stand. And so we want to call this identity or just where we are positioned, um, you know, multiple identities that, that, that form us or the multiple experiences, uh, our, our socialization. Um, and I, 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 you know, I cannot really entirely separate it, right, uh, from I mean, who I am from what, from, from the kind of research that I do. Another question is how much space should that occupy in my, in my, in my writing and my research? So, I mean, this on, on, on that debate. Um, then I just want to mention one, one thing briefly. What I think is, is interesting also to examine is, is, is these kind of, of I think uh, clearly we're referring at these initial debates in the European Union and the push from from, form, from countries in the former Soviet bloc to have uh, the crimes of totalitarianism acknowledged. In other words, you know, the thesis of the double genocide, and there was you know, genocide of Stalinism, and Nazi genocide. But um, what is relevant there, and what I think it's, it's important to see is how scholarly concepts and totalitarianism, and that's definitely not a, a, a new concept, Nathan um, is, is an expert on, on Arendt and on that concept, how it is incorporated, how it is used, how it is translated uh, in, uh, to a political agenda. And um, that push at that time was in response to January 27th initiative, and you know, this, this transnational global Holocaust memory is mostly a Western concept that was challenged from uh, by the, the, the former Soviet states, and uh, they proposed the uh, August 23 date, which is the, I think it's August 23, the Hitler Ribbentrop, the Soviet, uh, the Nazi Soviet pact. And, uh, but of course, that opens another series of, of problems uh, as, uh, you know, and, and clashes between those two memories. One thing that's relevant there is that many of those who were oppressed by the Soviet regime in the after, when, when, when one of those countries, I think the Baltic countries, for instance, were occupied, had been collaborators with the Nazi regime, had been actively um, collaborating in the perpetration of the, of, of the, of, uh, of the extermination of, of, of Jews and of the deportation of Jews to the, to the death camps. So anyway, um, there, there, there are a lot of, uh, Roland aspects there, I think it's important, I just wanted to mention that. So how do political agendas, how do actors in specific 
where the political fields translate scholarly concept may use instrumentalize those concepts with with, with particular laws no? which are not anymore apparently the universal uh, a universe an, an attempt to universalize uh, but actually um, an attempt to particularize through a language of universalization which is very prob problematic thank you very much alejandro uh, we um uh, indeed, uh, in terms of the time we had formally set, we are just three minutes away from the end, but I trust that the uh, presenters, the panelists, will all be happy to stick around. And as far as there is audience interest, we can extend this session beyond the 75 minutes we had initially uh, scheduled. So why I, I would like to invite members of the audience now to submit any questions they might have for any particular uh, particular panelist or for the panel as a whole and please type those questions comments provocations uh, doubts whatever there is into the chat function of our zoom uh, conversation and while they're doing that can i just respond to uh, nathan uh, schneider please uh, I, I, I realize that you say uh, there is uh, no correspondence, but as you know, the major fundamental premise of feminist theory is the personal is political, and the political is personal as well. In my case, if who my identity, what my identity is, is not important, why is it that I get death threats from people in Turkey and the Turkish state? I mean, that... I get death threats and other people who are not ethnically Turkish who take a stand on this issue the way I do, do not uh, uh, get them to the same degree or others, you know, get it, but only those who are ethnic Turks uh, who get it. I think who you are, uh, as Jürgen Habermas said, knowledge always has human interests inherent in it. So who you are makes a difference. I also get, for example, a lot of reaction when I go and give talks and using Hannah Arendt's insight, I tell them I'm not guilty for what happened in the past, but I'm responsible. And for that, I apologize. And when I do that, uh, the Turkish state again comes after me and the Armenians uh, in, in, instead uh, start talking to me where they do not, if I do not openly say where my stand is politically. That's why it's important, I think, to take that into account today. Thank you. Thank you, Muga. Uh, I don't see any questions coming. You Maybe the clarity of your comments was so overwhelming, but now the situation is changing. So we have one question no, that's just praise for the rich presentations. Um, there is a question for Professor Mouradion. There is a strong history of scholarship about Russian colonialism of not exclusively of Alaska, of my own Unangan Aleut people. My own studies are currently comparing the colonial experience of native Alaskans and their agency in terms of their relationship with the Russian Orthodox Church, specifically missionaries. I would speak a minute if I could briefly, but that does not work in the, um, in the format that we have chosen for this uh, webinar. Uh, another comment is, thank you so much for your brilliant interventions. One question for all who want to answer, to avoid comparing could lead to a privilege of some memories over others, question mark. So if we do not compare, would that lead to a privilege of some memories over others? Um, yes, the next one is a comment, again, comparing to Southern African countries, Lesotho and Botswana. Why don't we go around the room to see if this evokes any response among any of our panelists. Um, anyone? If I can say something about uh, Russian, Russia, Please. because it's my main field study, field of study, uh, there's a problem and then we come back to the issue of uh, taboo uh, that you have in your uh, 
the title of uh, of a panel. Uh, there is a taboo in uh, Russia that they have never been colonial empire. They have been expanded, uh, and there are even uh, uh, the imperial uh, Russians are uh, victims of their empire and not. <laughs> maybe. It was defensive expansion and so on. And I think that maybe when the colonial studies started, uh, it was Soviet, Soviet Russia, Soviet Union, and Soviet Union appear, wanted to appear as a champion of anti-colonialism anti and so on. So they, we, even the, when we talked about Soviet empire, it was kind of taboo at, at the time. So uh, the studies about the Russian uh, Tsarist and uh, Soviet times, uh, uh, well, way of uh, uh, dealing with this population is kind of uh, taboo, especially for uh, Russians, and uh, uh, so it's very complicated to, uh, but there are some uh, some works, especially for the Caucasus and Central Asia, but uh, not so much for the rest of, uh, uh, of uh, well, former Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, but nevertheless there are some. The same for uh, the Ottoman Empire. I think that due to the fact that most empires were had, uh, were colonized, people were Muslims. They couldn't admit that uh, Muslim empire could also be a colonizer or a colonial empire. So there is this kind of taboo. And I think the um, the identity is not uh, important. Uh, I'm, I agree with Nathan also. It's not uh, something. But in the case of, for instance, uh, the genocide against Armenia, uh, due to denialism. Uh, the identity of the scholars are important. It's not the same for, for instance, the Holocaust. There is not much denialism as, apart from uh, some uh, uh, few people, I mean, or some uh, special state uh, and it's also politics. But in the case of uh, the Armenian genocide, it's such a problem in Turkey that uh, uh, it's very, um, in a way, uh, it's part, of, well, affirm affirming its identity like Mugedid or some others, I'm thinking of Etemel Dem or some, some others who are not specifically, uh, it's not only a scholar, uh, scholarly uh, uh, study, it's also uh, a kind of uh, civic duty, a kind of uh, civic, uh, citizen act. And in that way, uh, it's, I disagree with Nathan. We will also have, always are activists someplace, so in, in a way, when we study these kind of issues. We are not studying Italian art at the time of the Renaissance. I, I regret I didn't start, I didn't study these kind of things. I was <laughs> studying Stalinist horrors and Ottoman horrors. But, uh, well, we are not studying uh, something. Um, something as uh, uh, the inflation of uh, uh, the cereals uh, before the revolution in France or these kind of issues. We are studying something which is not which is not common. I mean, which is uh, very uh, special. And in that we are we are to be also we are also citizens uh, in the in the sense of uh, we use in France. So it's not indifferent that uh, uh, and it's important also because it's part of that people, uh, scholars like Muguet and some others uh, aff affirm their identity because it's a way to uh, go to also uh, recognition and to, uh, it's a fight against uh, denialism because all the studies, the, the Turkish state uh, denialism, he said, well, of course, all these uh, studies are made by Christians or Armenians or whatever, and they are our enemies. But it's very important to have studies from inside. In this, in this case, well, not for all, all genocides, but when very, denialism is very strong, uh, problem is different. And I wanted to also uh, yeah. uh, praise the courage of our Turkish colleagues, and especially those who are also in Turkey and living there, or have families there, and because it's... Uh, uh, it's very uh, difficult to work. It's not. Uh... Thank, thank you, Claire. Indeed, it is, <clears throat> and I learned to appreciate the courage of our Turkish colleagues uh, along the way in France, in the United States, in Germany. Uh, there are three comments. So, so maybe somebody would like to say something in response to what Claire Moradion just said. There are three comments slash questions. Uh, and I'm just going to read them and whoever would like to, to say something in response to them from the audience, uh, please, uh, we'll have a round. Uh, comparing South African countries, Lesotho, Botswana, both peoples used 
missionaries very consciously get to gain traction in colonial situations. King Moshe Ueshu had his, his missionary, King Kama said he had to get his own missionary. Both were able to prevent their lands being consumed by South Africa proper. So this may speak to the agency question that uh, Müge raised a moment ago. A question, and this was a comment from uh, Cassian Bobel. And then Laura Cohn wrote, I agree about the importance of self-reflexivity and that how our scholarship is received or criticized cannot always be divorced from our identities. That's even more true as it relates to the gender of the scholar as well as when discussing other genocides slash mass atrocities that are all fiercely con uh, contested. Um, Isabel Aspe writes, very interesting to mention here Imam Shamir, resistance to orthodox, quote, genocide of Caucasians. And Cassian Vobel has another comment, which we may get to if we have more time. There is Yigit Khan Eriaman, uh, who says, is there a consensus among historians regarding how the 1915 Ottoman Empire events are categorized, for example, genocide, disaster, deportation, etc.? If not, what's the best uh, way to establish such consensus. So a bunch of questions, not everybody will <laughs> want to comment on, e on each of these, but why don't we use this as a last round where everyone can comment on what Claire just said a moment ago and or to one or the other of the uh, publics of the audience's comments or questions. And let's go around in the same order in which you presented, beginning with uh, Müge and Jacob, and then on to Nathan, then to Alejandro, and then we'll... Think, <coughs> please. Thank you. I think I've talked enough, so I want Jacob to have a chance to especially use the African context and what he thinks in that context. Thank you. Sure, thanks, Muge. Um, I guess there's a lot to respond, so I'll start with... Um, my identity as a grad student, I think, has inherent power differentials from the faculty on the panel. So what I say will be viewed differently than what faculty say. And I think that is why saying our identities is important, because if I were to publish something with my identity, it will appear differently than if a faculty member does so. That being said, as a white American man, I have to speak up because silence has been the norm in America and we continue to deny the genocide against the Native Americans and Black people through slavery to today. And I think these are great comparisons for the rest of the world and how we compare and criticize how we respond to genocide. There's genocides ongoing right now and our lack of acknowledgement of them as Americans continue to let them go and we often wait until they're over to respond to them because we assume that the silence will continue until it's too late. Um, I think that it could, there's been a lot of great comments in the chat. So I think the comparison definitely, if we do not compare them, we allow others to maintain their power over others um, when we don't recognize them or allow the silence and denial of other genocides. That is why we need to compare them in order to bring them to the forefront of them being acknowledged for the lives lost. Um, I think that that about sums up what, what I have to say. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Thank you, Muga, for leaving the floor to Jacob. Uh, Nathan, do you have any additional comments in response to Claire or to the uh, to the audience? Uh, no, I think I've said my piece. So I'm I'm deferring to the next speaker as well. Right, thank you very much. But but let let me uh, sorry if I, if I may. There there is a difference, Nathan. Maybe you want to comment on this. There is a difference between the scholar trying to take an objective position and to abstract her or himself themselves from uh, a particular identity. Clearly, that does not work when it comes to audience responses. Right, and you know this, I know this as a German, there are things I cannot say as a German um, without evoking outrage. Uh, there are other things I can say as a German that will grant me applause 
and the same is true for for uh, for Muga as a Turk with regard to the Armenian genocide. Um, do you want to comment maybe on that distinction, Nathan, on what you, the kind of discipline you impose on yourself, the, the effort toward speaking about genocides from a position that is not marked by a particular identity and the responses you get that force you to, force is maybe not the right word, but that possibly force you to respond to those reactions? Yeah, sure. I mean, people try to do that. I mean, I, I could raise now my flag and say, you know, I'm white, I'm Jewish, I'm male, uh, can also say I'm the son of a Holocaust survivor. I mean, these, these are a, a part of who I am, but I have to keep all these things in check. I have all to keep my demons in check when I start uh, thinking and writing. And if people want to push me back into these knees and into these these flags that that uh, I mean I I can only answer to 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 the saying that the personal is, is is the political and the political is the personal to say that the personal is the personal and the political is the political and that we have to keep them separate, in my opinion. But I also know that most people right now, the, 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 the scholarship, especially in the field that we engaged in, is going into the different direction. So we are sort of like throwing each other's identities around and use them as sticks to beat each other. I don't think that helps. I don't think that, uh, I think, of course, that comparisons are extremely important. I don't think they bridge. I think they are used now to, to turn down bridges. And I think there's a very serious problem in the field of genocide and Holocaust and collective violence studies that everybody is entering the, the playing field uh, with their identities as a protective shield and it's not getting us anywhere. Uh, and even if the audience then wants me to go back to that, I'm not willing to do that. All right, thank you, Nathan. What, one thing I think we all agree on, that we need the words of those who have the courage to stand up against the stream of their national dominant opinion or of their disciplinary dominant opinion. And uh, Müger does that with her research on the Armenian genocide. Nathan does it with his epistemological position. We need this kind of courage. And I think that is something we all do agree on. Uh, Müger has raised her hand and uh, why don't we give her the floor briefly and then maybe uh, if that's all right also with Claire, I'm not sure if you wanted to have a concluding word, otherwise we'll pass it on to Alejandro for, for the last word in today's uh, panel. Uh, Müger, please, you had raised your hand. Let me just, uh, let me just say that uh, I think Nathan uh, is definitely taking objectivity uh, as one way, by disengaging uh, the personal from the political. Uh, there is, as you know, in Western European modernity, the privileging of knowledge over experience. And knowledge is defined uh, uh, scientifically, so to speak. And when you use your objectivity as scholars, what happens is that you are basically totally silencing your own experience and how that uh, impacts uh, the position you're taking. And that is exactly why I think bottom-up uh, approaches have started emerging. How do you uh, allow uh, or let or let seep through uh, the agency, the meanings that people who have been silenced in the past make? I mean, that is why I think objectivity, if we use it in this context, in the context of social meaning, actually means uh, you, that you are, by being objective, reproducing uh, the power of the status quo and uh, the top-down approach. And that's what I take issue with. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Muga. I hope you don't think of me as a bad convener in that I allow the conversation to drift away from the topic of comparing and bridging um, 
Uh, I know that Claire has raised her hand. She okay. first declined, but please, Claire, and, and then. Oh, Claire. it's just the last thing. I just want to say that, uh, well, Mark, what I think, in, at least in history or whatever, which we, we study or we are interested in it, we are interested in it. There is no, there never exists true objectivity or true neutrality in this philosophical term, uh, sense of the word. There is only honesty. Very often they say, oh, you, see, you said that, this or that, because you are from Armenian origin, you have ancestors, but no, I'm also a French researcher, I'm completely uh, uh, fed with a French uh, way of thinking and my, well, my period, my generation or my gender or whatever, but uh, there, there can be on, only honesty and uh, this is not, uh, and honesty st starts by saying where you, where you speak from, and uh, uh, which observatory, and then you check it, of course, you put distance, you are not uh, crying all the way, you are not writing uh, lacrimal history, as uh, Caspi said. That's, I just want to say that neutrality or objectivity uh, don't exist per se, you are always involved. So uh, you, better to say that I'm involved that way, and, and then you study the thing and uh, knowing that and it's part of the reflexivity that you that you said. But I'm not putting that also saying that well, I'm also working as a French historian. Thank you. Uh, one of the uh, uh, audience comments just reminded us that the issues of depicting social reality that we face in scholarship, of course, is faced in other fields of knowledge production too, like in documentary filmmaking, uh, which may seek objectivity, but where the angle of the camera and many other features uh, may tell a story into which the subjectivity of the filmmaker flows, if I understand the comment correctly. Um, uh, again, important that we mark out the different positions that rage in this debate, and it's, I so much appreciate not having a a mutual consensus assembly here because that's what scholarship is about. It's about engagement, juxtaposition of contrasting, um, contrasting uh, positions. Let me pass the word on to Alejandro Baer, who, is, who always has the last word of wisdom in our circle and appropriately so. Alejandro, please. Well, I've uh, had to say anything, right, after you put me on the spot. Uh, like that. But um, I don't know, I just wanted to mention one thing, uh, I, just an email exchange I had with um, uh, one of our graduate students, Nika Sremak, who's in the audience, and uh, I, she, uh, in that wonderful presentation she, she did together with others uh, last Friday, she brought up personal experience. She brought up personal experience uh, as a, if, if I may, Nika, uh, share this. Uh, as a child of Serbian immigrants in the U.S. and how she uh, related to the stories of the, of the Serbo-Bosnian War of the 90s as a child. And I, in an email, I, when I, I got back, I gave her feedback on, on the presentation, I said, this is excellent material, just as it's excellent material, uh, the 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 the, the citation, and the, sorry, the examples that Joachim brings in his book about growing up in Germany in the 50s and the question of silence. So personal experience can be a wonderful source of inspiration to think uh, about, um, precisely about the, the questions we are we're exploring in our, in our research. So uh, I, I, I see the point Nathan is, is, is making and I see also that we have, but I think we have a sort of a spectrum of, of, of issues here, you know, it's not an either or, and I would agree to a certain extent, and I see it also that in post-colonial scholarship and even some sort of dominant um, um, signalizing, public signalizing that sometimes can come across as virtue signalizing of and which I find problematic. You know, some of these framings, because I think it's, 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 it's purely performative. So I think there are issues to, to discuss there. Uh, but uh, yeah, I would, I would leave it there and maybe just, um, um, yeah, I agreeing with you, I think that discussion and, and contentious debate should be part of our, of our conversations. I always say to my students in Minnesota, um, it's okay to disagree, 
actually in Spain, I was saying exactly the contrary. I was saying, it's also okay to agree. <laughs> so, so that, yeah, thank you all. I, I really enjoyed, it, enjoyed the. Well, let me, let me uh, thank all presenters, Fatma Muge Gürtschik and Jacob Caponi from Michigan, Nathan Snyder from Israel, Alejandro Baer from Minnesota, Claire Moradion from Paris, France. Uh, uh, we could make this the beginning of an extended seminar and spend the next two days together to tackle the different issues that came up today. If we were able to raise important issues today to mark positions that are worthy of future debate, uh, then we will have achieved something very fine. And this conversation will be publicly available, understand. I also want to thank Joe Eggers, as Alejandro Baer did earlier, for doing the technical part of this work. Without it, we couldn't hold our seminars. And thank you all. Thanks to the audience for being here, for the questions you typed into the chat function. And herewith, I end today's session. Uh, thank you all very, very, very much. Goodbye. Thank you all from my end as well. Thank you. Thank you, Joachim. Thank you, Alessandro. Thank you, Mugge. Thank you, yeah. Nathan. And, Thank you. Uh, well, well, hope one day we'll can uh, talk live <laughs> together <laughs> in the same yeah. room. Bye-bye. <laughs> everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Joachim. Bye.